All right. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. You're going to have to be a very interactive crowd with the size of you. <laughs> but we're going to talk about high tunnel crop rotation. And I'm Annette Wislacki. I'm the vegetable extension specialist at the University of Tennessee. And I'm happy you joined us. So we're talking about rotation tonight. And rotation is really important, no matter if you're in a high tunnel or in a field because it has so, so many benefits in our production system from soil health quality um, to helping us use our fertilizers most effectively, which is really important in a year like this when every fertilizer is very, very expensive. It also helps with our IPM program. So rotation is gonna help with your weeds, your diseases and your insects and can also help you reduce the need for those off farm inputs. It's gonna help you with your moisture management and it actually can improve your quality and yield and help with erosion and biodiversity and water and such. So lots and lots of benefits. And generally, when we talk about rotation, we want to think about our production area in blocks or sections. And in an ideal world, your rotation would work easily if all of those sections or crop families were the same size, but that rarely, if ever, happens. So we need to think about other creative ways, how we can mix it up and work in a rotation in a given area, such as a high tunnel. So another way to think about it is the years in your rotation cycle. So just because you might have 10 different uh, sections on your farm, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have a 10 year rotation and every operation is going to be different and you need to tailor it for what works for your farm. In our field production at the UT organic farm, we have half acre plots. So we work in those half acres to rotate around um, our different crop families and our cool and our warm season crops and things, because that's what makes sense for us. And then we also have multiple high tunnels, which makes rotation for our high tunnel system easier. But we know that everybody doesn't always have that uh, luxury to have multiple tunnels to rotate amongst. So the last thing to think about is the number of crops in your rotation. So most small growers are going to grow a whole lot of diversified crops, and that's true for high tunnel folks as well as field folks. But in high tunnel, we tend to get into a pattern of the same crops over and over because they're profitable, and we'll talk about that. So then we have to further divide those crops that we're growing into their botanical classification or the plant part that's consumed, which kind of goes along with that, or the space that it's going to utilize. So this is just an example of a field rotation from Elliot Coleman, who is a year round grower up in Maine. And he does this eight year vegetable crop rotation because that's what makes sense for his farm. And he has a nice rationale for why he does this rotation that he does. For example, you can see that the tomatoes and the potatoes are about four years away from each other. And that's because they're in the same crop family, that solanaceous crop family. And we wanna break the pest cycle by rotating out of a particular crop family. Then he has um, the potatoes and the squash or pumpkins before he has the root crops, because that's a great way to reduce the weed pressure in those tiny crops that you have to really get in and amongst to weed like radishes and beets and carrots. So there's a good rationale. He also works in cover crops and green manures in here. And that's really important too. And we'll spend some time talking about how you might do that in a high tunnel situation as well. This is another way to think about rotation and it's not a perfect system, but it kind of hits on the highlights. So this is Ogden's four year rotation cycle. And to simplify things a little bit, he breaks it down into the leafy crops, the legumes, the fruit crops and the root crops and has this four year ro rotation among them. And that gets to different crop families, but it also gets to different things like the root crops are going to have macro tillage that they're going to do. If we think about the roots of all these crops, the leafy crops often tend to have a tap root. The root crops really have a large root. And then some of these fruiting crops and the legumes have uh, more of a significant root system that really goes out into the dirt. 
but kind of that micro tillage and micro pores in your soil. So they all fill their niche and do important things. So this is another way to think about rotation that's a little simpler. When we're talking about high tunnels, we know that they're really production intensive because you've paid to have that high tunnel put on your farm and it's an investment. And so it's high dollar real estate. And we often have tillage intensive high tunnels because we want to till them, get another production cycle in there. And we can, in our region, we can produce year round. They're also irrigation intensive because we need to supply all of that water. So we have to have a way to get the moisture to the crop. And they're basically like an irrigated desert because they're not getting any of that overhead rain. We know that they're also warmer in the field, but variable in temperature. So they have more extremes from day to night on a fairly cool but sunny day. Once that sun goes down, they're going to lose a lot of heat in there. So we see more extensive dips in the temperature. So this is typically what we see in tunnels in Tennessee and I'm sure in Kentucky too. We have a crop of tomatoes because they're the most uh, lucrative vegetable that we can grow in a high tunnel. And I'll show you some economic data later on on that. And then we rotate in the fall and winter into leafy greens like lettuces. And this is great for the first several years that we're doing it. And we think, wow, this is fantastic. I have really nice tomatoes and I have this great lettuce that I can sell at a winter's farmer's market or sell to restaurants or local markets. But then after a few years, this is what we start to see. We see diseases that come in and there's various diseases that can come into high tunnel. The soil borne ones like southern blight are ones that are going to stay in that soil for a long time. And they're part of the reason that we like to rotate because if we're not rotating, we're not breaking that disease cycle. And once we get a disease into our high tunnel soil, we're in big trouble. We either have to move the tunnel itself to new land or we have to completely rotate out of a crop like tomato for probably many, many years till we can get rid of that disease in some way. With lettuce, we see a similar thing. So over time, we see white mold or uh, sclerotinia drop, it's also known as. But both of these diseases um, are soil borne. So they remain in the soil for a long time. They have overwintering structures, but there are plenty of other diseases that can come in as well. So disease is one of the reasons that we really want to rotate, even in a tunnel situation. And we'll talk about um, ways that we can do that. Another reason that we want to rotate around and another issue that we see in tunnels over time is salinity. And that's again because we don't have those overhead rains flushing out salts in the soil from fertilizers that we're using. And so they remain in the soil. And I think this is a really great photo. This is from Tim Kulong when he was in Kentucky, I believe. And this is a grower that was growing in high tunnels for many years. And you can see the difference in the size of the plants. So about halfway back, you see the plants are much taller. And what happened was the grower extended their high tunnel. So they added on a new tunnel here where the plants are tall, but they're the same variety of tomato and he produced them exactly the same way. So when they went out to look at these to try to figure out what was going on, they took some soil samples. And what they found is that the sodium had built up to 700 pounds per acre in the front part of this tunnel where the plants are short. And it was only at 50 to 80 pounds per acre in the back where the plants are tall. And you wouldn't notice that over time because all those plants are uniform and they still look relatively healthy. But once you see that new growth, you're like, wow, what's going on here? So it's really important um, to rotate because different crops can help with salinity as well. But We'll talk about different ways you can rotate in a minute. And this is a good one, especially for folks who have not purchased high tunnels yet. I always recommend that you think about a movable tunnel. So when we think about traditional high tunnels, they're stationary, they're oftentimes cemented into the ground so they don't blow away. But a movable tunnel 
really opens up your rotation options and helps prevent a lot of those problems that I just talked about. So the disease issues and salinity issues over time. And we really wanna think long-term because this is really valuable high dollar space. So the top image is a Google Earth flip photo of the University of Kentucky movable tunnels. And it shows you that these tunnels are moving back and forth across those three fields. So movable tunnels are going to generally be shorter, much shorter than a stationary tunnel. Oftentimes we have 30 by 96 stationary tunnels, but when we're talking about movable tunnels, they either have to be moved with a tractor or by human power. And so they tend to be about 30 feet, 30 to 36 feet long. And so that way you can start a crop a cool season crop, move the tunnel, start another crop and move it again if you'd like. And we'll talk about what some of those rotations might look like. But you can also incorporate cover crops really easily into this rotation because you have the space. So if you haven't thought about getting a movable tunnel, they would be something to look into. Um, and in Tennessee, we have two cost share programs. So we have the Tennessee Ag Enhancement Program that helps cost share high tunnels and other things. And then both in Tennessee and Kentucky, we have the NRCS equip program. So that's a great way if you don't already have a tunnel to get a high tunnel on your farm. And you can see the track here. There are a lot of different designs for these movable tunnels. One is like a chain link fence track and that's what this one is here. So it has a wheel that you go up and down the pipe on and can move that tunnel back and forth here they're constructing one at Montana State University in the bottom right hand corner and you can see those wheels on the track there that you can move them around. Generally with that sort of track system it takes about four people to move a tunnel back and forth so it doesn't take very much labor at all. All right so this is from a publication from um, the Center for Crop Diversification from the University of Kentucky. And the resource, the link to it is at the very back of my slide set. It's on the last slide. I have a whole list of resources for you there. So this is if you only wanna move that tunnel once, but you have those three fields like we just saw. So visualize that here's field one, here's field two, and here's field three, or field one, two, and three up there. So if you only wanna move that tunnel once per year, you would start in the winter slash spring under the tunnel with an overwintered crop like greens or root vegetables or strawberries that you planted in the previous fall. Then you're gonna leave the tunnel there for spring and summer. You're gonna harvest off those winter crops. You're gonna prep your beds and plant an early high value crop like a tomato or a pepper. Then we're going to take that field one, we're going to move the tunnel off of it to field two, and we're going to plant a cover crop in field one or leave it fallow or use as an uncover field for a fall or winter crop, cash crop. So in field two, in that winter spring time frame, we're going to have a cover crop or leave it fallow or overwinter an outdoor crop, something like garlic or strawberries. And then in field two, we're gonna still plant a spring or summer crop, fallow or cover crop in preparation for the high tunnel coming into that space in the fall. And then in the fall, we move that tunnel over and now we can plant a later fall crop, tomatoes or greens, or we can plant strawberries for the next year. And we can do that before or after the move. So generally on the ends of the movable tunnels, you also have a curtain that you can lift up so you can go over plants that aren't very big yet. And that's really beneficial because a lot of crops we can plant before we move the tunnel and then just move the tunnel right over it as they need it. So in field three, in this situation, it's never going to have the tunnel over it in this, in this first year. So it's going to have a cover crop or fallow or an overwintered crop, and then we're going to plant a spring or summer crop or a cover crop, and then we're going to plant a cover crop or a cash crop or fallow, and that's going to get the high tunnel the following fall. If we want to utilize all 
three of those fields and do two moves per year, it might look something like this. So very similar for the crops, for the fields that aren't being, that aren't covered by the crop, by the high tunnel, sorry. So you're gonna either have overwintered crops, greens, root vegetables, strawberries that you planted in the fall. Then we're gonna move it to field two and we're gonna plant early high value crops after we move it like a tomato or a pepper. And then we're gonna move it again to field three and plant later fall crops or roots or strawberries there. So in these other fields, you see you can utilize cover crops very well to build that soil in between when that high tunnel is going to be back in that area of the field. So it really opens up your rotation options and is really a good way to go because you avoid all of those issues like the salinity because you're going to have overhead rains on that field when it's not covered. So for two thirds of the year in this situation, it's going to be uncovered and that really helps um, remove the salts from the system. So when we're talking about high tunnel management and field management, we always talk about sustainable soil management because soil is really uh, critical because we want to maintain good healthy soil in order to grow good high quality crops that are going to continue to yield well for us. So cover crops are great for that because they're going to contribute nitrogen and other nutrients and they're going to feed that soil food web so they are going to give fresh versus decomposed organic matter to all the critters there in the soil you can see all the worms in this in the photo in the back or the drawing in the back and they can also help capture the nutrients while those salts are leached out so we're going to retain nutrients up in that root zone but we're going to leach all the salts out that we don't want in that root zone so legumes, of course, for a cover crop are going to give us some supplemental nitrogen. And again, in a year like this, when fertilizer prices are really high, cover crops are a very economical choice to use for a fertilizer and can give us a lot of nitrogen that we need for many crops. The non-legumes are going to help us capture and recycle those nutrients in our system. And then all these cover crops are going to help prevent our soil from eroding and help build our carbon and feed that microbial community. And that is in turn going to help us break our pest cycles. So as I mentioned, over time, we tend to see diseases build up like sclerotinia and lettuce. Last uh, webinar, Rachel talked about nematodes and grafting. But that's another area where we see buildup in high tunnels sometimes. So for that sclerotinia, we could plant something like a mighty mustard as a biofumigant in our tunnel, which would help take care of it. With nematodes, there are options that can help with your nematodes, and velvet bean is one that's a biocontrol for them. So why would you might not want to cover crop in a tunnel? As I mentioned it is really high value real estate and if you're taking that production out of a cash crop that equals money that could be put in your pocket however if you're depleting your soil you're going to run into issues down the road where you're not getting the yield output that you could so we need to think about the timing around those high value crops that we want to grow and you want to think about the opportunity costs so the crops that you can't grow while you're uh, working on cover cropping, uh, the decomposition of the cover crop, because that's going to take more time out of growing a cash crop, and then other complexities, which we'll talk about. The other thing about cover cropping, maybe you don't want to cover crop your whole entire high tunnel. Maybe you want to do it a bed at a time. As you have a crop that comes out, you could put a cover crop in a particular bed, and that's another way to think about it. So how can we make cover crops work in a high tunnel system. So the first thing we want to do is we want to identify a niche in our system. And then we'll talk about adaptive management practices that we're going to have to use if we are utilizing a cover crop. In the high. For cool season covers, oftentimes we only are growing tomatoes in those tunnels if we're not doing a lettuce rotation. And so for if we want to put in a cool season cover after our tomatoes come out in the late fall, you're going to plant that crop late that's going to allow your plants to reach maturity and then they're going to terminate better 
or you can use a winter killed summer cover for early plantings in a high tunnel situation. For termination, we want to think about killing early and killing often because the growth of cover crops inside your high tunnel is going to be much, much larger than you would get in the field. So you want to think about that on the front end as well, that you have a method to terminate that crop. If you're using a bush hog in the field, it might not work as well in a tunnel, depending on the crop you choose and how big it gets inside that tunnel. So it's just something to think about. A lot of folks just go in and continuously mow that cover crop in a tunnel to keep it at a manageable level. So that's something you want to think about on the front end. And then we'll talk more about adaptive management. So for warm season covers, if we're growing tomatoes and we want to get a cover in really fast before we put lettuces or other greens in, buckwheat can be a good choice because it's going to mature even faster in the field than in the field. So in the field, it generally matures in about 60 days. In a tunnel, it's going to be about half that, so 30 to 40 days. Buckwheat's great because it can also be habitat for beneficial insects, so it's going to draw them into your tunnel and they will do a lot of your insect control for you. And that goes a long way. It does break down fairly readily, but it can reseed itself and this is never an issue for us. We like to have buckwheat around. Some people don't like it popping up in their tunnel, but like I said, it draws in the beneficial insects like the lace wings that do a lot of our aphid control for us. So we never mind a buckwheat plant that is a volunteer. Um, if you want to use buckwheat, you can broadcast 50 to 100 pounds per acre, and it's typically going to give you about two to three tons of biomass, and it's going to give you about 45 to 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So it's a nice nitrogen boost in there. We do have, uh, also in your resources, two publications on, well, three publications on cover cropping in high tunnels. Um, that are also on the Center for Crop Diversification website. And one is on just general overview of using cover crops in high tunnels. Another one is on warm season cover crops. And the third one is on cool season cover crops. So if you're thinking about cover crops, I would encourage you to look up those publications because there's lots of good information about choosing the cover crop for what you want it to do and a good list of cr cover crops there that you might use. So for planting and managing cover crops in a tunnel, generally we're going to broadcast them and then lightly incorporate them. That's going to be most common and the easiest thing to do in a tunnel since we have limited space. You do want to think about irrigation, especially for germination of your cover crop. So in our tunnel, we generally shut the water off at the end of the cash crop season because that's when the weather starts to get cold. But in a situation in a high tunnel, you want to make sure you still have that water going to get those seeds germinated. And in our high tunnel, we usually use drip irrigation down our beds. Well, if you want a, a cover crop in your whole entire high tunnel, you're going to have to think about some sort of overhead system or another system besides drip irrigation, because you would need a, a lot of lines of drip irrigation to get that established. And there are a lot of good overhead watering uh, kits and things that you can get for a tunnel. As I mentioned, you want to think about how you're going to terminate the crop. Um, if you mow it at physiological maturity, it's going to be helpful, but not completely necessary. So physiological maturity is when those seeds are viable. So if you don't want things to reseed, you want to make sure you're getting it then. But it's also time for many crops when you'll have the most benefit for your soil as well, especially some of the biofumigants. That's a good stage to get them. Um, you can use herbicides in high tunnel situations, but you do want to make sure you use caution, read the label carefully, and make sure uh, you're following the label. For decomposition in a tunnel, you also need water. So you want to think about that too. Um, and you need heat and you need time. So you need to budget in that extra time for that cover crop to break down. If you don't give it enough time to break down and you come in after tilling it in or otherwise terminating it, then we can start to see issues with grubs and things in the roots of our brand newly transplanted crops. And so we want to make sure we give it plenty of time to decompose. 
And then I promised we'd talk about adaptive management strategies. So you might also need to do additional bed preparation because you are going to have a lot of cover crop residue in there. You wanna make sure you're getting those biggest chunks out because they're the ones that aren't gonna break down. And we want them to break down before we get our transplants in there. So we're starving out any grubs that might be in the soil. In some cases, you may get regrowth if you didn't terminate it successfully or if it reseeds itself. This is especially true if you're trying to do reduced tillage. And then the third one, which we've experienced in our tunnel personally, is some of the residue from your cover crop may tie up that nitrogen. So foliar testing can be really critical to make sure your crop has everything it needs at various plant stages. So foliar testing is fairly easy to do. Um, you can send it off to ag testing services. Um, you can also get a nitrate meter and test it yourself on the farm to measure nutrient solutions. Um, you would just squeeze sap out onto this little nitrate meter and it would tell you what the plant's reading. If you send it off, you're gonna get a paper bag so you don't get moldy before it gets to the lab. And you wanna make sure that you're getting enough plant material uh, prior to fruiting to send off. Generally, the lab's gonna want 20 to 25 young, fully mature leaves. That's gonna give you a read on what's going on in that whole tunnel. So if you get 20 to 25 leaves, send them off. They'll get you information back if you're lacking in any of your nutrients, and then you can adjust in real time. And we see more and more folks doing foliar testing in both high tunnels and in field situations, because it's really the only way to know what's going on in your plant. A soil test is great in the fall prior to the spring season, because it's going to tell you what's going on in the soil. And we can make adjustments then to make sure our soil is where we need it to be for whatever we're planting. But uh, foliar testing is really going to be the only indicator of what's going on during the season. So several years ago, we did a SARE project with Krista Jacobson from the University of Kentucky. And we looked at whether we replacing a lettuce cash crop in the fall with a cover crop outweighed the costs of taking our tunnel out of production for that time. So I'm going to hit some highlights in this experiment tonight so we can move on to talk about other elements of rotation as well. But I think cover crops are really an important one, but I want to make sure you think through all of the things that you need to for a cover crop. So for our experiment, we had four different fall winter treatments. One was a winter wheat cover crop by itself. One was crimson clover cover crop by itself. And then another was a wheat and clover mixture. And mixtures are always a good idea when we're talking about cover crops because they have different benefits to your system. So for example, the crimson clover is going to give us nitrogen and the winter wheat is going to be good for choking out the weeds. All of the grains or grasses are good for filling in the space and choking out the weeds. But when we mix, it's also like crop insurance. So if for some reason we didn't get good germination on one cover crop, the other one can fill in those gaps as well. Our fourth treatment was the lettuce cash crop. And we used two different varieties in the years we were doing this study. So we divided our tunnel up into 30 foot beds in each high tunnel. And then our cover crops were sown and our lettuce was planted in October. And those cover crops were mowed in March. And then they were tilled in five days after we mowed them. We did supplement our um, cover crops with Nature Safe 855. And we spread that about two weeks later and tilled it in. And we based the fertilizer amount for those different treatments on the nitrogen credit from our cover crop biomass. So for example, in the clover plots, we had to add less fertilizer. And we used the cover crop calculator from University of Idaho, and the link for it is there to determine our nitrogen from the biomass that we had in our plots. And then we planted early girl tomatoes in late March in all of the treatments. So this just highlights yield by size class. And particularly if we just look at the large 
You can see in 2017, both in Kentucky and Tennessee, we had higher yields than we had in 2018, respective to our locations. In 2018, especially in Tennessee, we suffered from yellow shoulder disorder. And this is yellow shoulder disorder. So just as the name implies, we start to see the yellowing around the top of the fruit. And it doesn't hurt anything, like it's still something someone can eat. It's not harmful to for folks, but that area is gonna be hard and it's not going to be juicy. It's not gonna be flavorful. So basically you would cut off half that tomato and lose it because you're not gonna eat that yellow hard portion. So yellow shoulder disorder is a disorder that's poorly understood, but there's several things that are thought to contribute to it. So one is the environment. Um, temperatures over 90 degrees, which we often experience in a high tunnel in both Kentucky and Tennessee, especially in summer. And then nutrition in our soil and in turn in the crop. It's also cultivar dependent and it has been linked to virus as well. So one of the main things that they think is behind yellow shoulder disorder is insufficient exchangeable potassium or excess magnesium in relation to calcium, and if your pH is above 6.7. So some of the best management practices to prevent this yellow shoulder disorder, which really knocked out a lot of our fruit and made it unmarketable, especially that second year, is tissue analysis, as I mentioned, at first flower is really important because that's right when those fruit are going to start setting. We wanna make sure they have what they need. So they're not going to have this uh, physiological disorder. At that time, if necessary, when you get your tissue analysis back, you can increase your potassium to greater than 3% by dry matter before those fruits reach an inch in diameter. And you can also increase your magnesium and calcium ratio. One to six or one to four is gonna be ideal. And you can also adjust your soil pH. If it's creeping up, you can bring it back down with either sulfuric or citric acid. And you can do that right through your drip tape. And you can apply an appropriate fertilizer. So what we found, this was a two year study and we didn't see a lot of changes in the soil itself, just like in the field the positive effects of cover crops are going to take several years to become apparent. So you need to keep at it. Just because you don't see it in the first year or two doesn't mean it's not starting to take effect. Um, the legume or the legume grass biculture may be best for early cash crop planting. We found that the clover plots had yields that were comparable to lettuce plots, but with less fertilizer cost. So that was beneficial. We found that wheat was the best at outcompeting weeds. But we did find, especially in Knoxville, that it tied up our nitrogen during the tomato growing season. So we visually rated our plants because you could see, just like with that salinity issue I showed you, in our wheat plots, you could see that the plants were visibly shorter. And that's because that wheat residue was likely tying up some nitrogen. And as I showed you, we had a high percentage of unmarketable fruit due to yellow shoulder disorder in 2018. So cover crops take some nuancing, but they are worth your time and finding that right niche in your, in your high tunnel time, whether that be by moving your tunnel and doing it in the open field or incorporating cover crops into your beds as you take crops out. The other thing, which I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on, and I always hate to show this as a vegetable specialist, and this is fairly old data now, but you get the gist of what it's showing. So this is um, hoop house prices from Wild Onion Farm. And they grow a lot of cut flowers, which when we're talking about crop rotation, cut flowers are a great one to think about. So it shows you a whole list of their cut flowers here, and then their harvest and planting dates, and then the revenue per square foot. So as you can see, something like um, Dianthus is going to net you over $5 per square foot. And this was back in 2000. 
So 20 years ago, Dianthus would net you $5 per square foot in a high tunnel. Something like Larkspur is going to get you $3.25 per square foot. And then we look at some of the vegetables up here. Arugula gets you $1.31. Cilantro, $0.95 cents per square foot. Green onions, about $0.60 cents per square foot. But if we come down here, tomatoes are right up there in that cut flower range. So they're another one that's going to get you over $3.50 per square foot. And that's why we see so many folks that continuously put tomato in their tunnels year after year because they're going after that high dollar. But incorporating cut flowers in there can give you that same return on your investment. And these are a couple photos from the Weedigers who are near Bowling Green, Kentucky. They ran a natural farm for many years. Uh, Paul is retired now, but still a wealth of information. And when they did their cut flowers, they used this netting and it was uh, a good way to stabilize their stems. When you're doing cut flowers, you're going to get more growth than you would in the field. So it's important that you have a way to stabilize your stems because you're going to have stems that are really stretched out, which is great if you're growing cut flowers. So some of their, like their sweet peas, they would do along this fencing. They had the poles going down the center of this tunnel so they could attach that netting right to those poles. And then it's a trellis for their flowers. Over here, they used it laying it flat on the ground to give their stem some support and then this is their display at their farmers market of all their cut flowers that they grew in the tunnel so you can see snapdragons and all sorts of good stuff in there so i'm not going to delve into those too much because i'm the vegetable lady another option that we talked a little bit about already when we were looking at the movable tunnel uh, rotations were strawberries and we grew strawberries in our tunnels here about 10 years ago now and uh, Carrie Rivard at Kansas State University has also done strawberries in their tunnels and ran some of the economics on them and he did 1600 plants per 4800 square foot tunnel and calculating at four dollars a pound for strawberries he came up with a return a gross uh, of $1.76 per square foot. So still not reaching the level of tomatoes in a tunnel. We were really excited about strawberries, uh, especially on the organic farm uh, when we grew them 10 years ago, but that was right around the time when spotted wing drosophila hit the scene. And spotted wing drosophila, if you're not familiar with it, is a little fruit fly that uh, really is devastating to a lot of fruit crops and we'll get in that crop and the larva will come out after you've harvested it oftentimes when your berry crop is in the refrigerator so it's not good for marketing um, there's a lot of folks working on organic options for control of spotted wing drosophila but as of yet i haven't heard of a really good one that'll control it and in a high tunnel situation Generally, the spotted wing drosophila, being a fruit fly, will die out in the field, and strawberries are generally not as affected by them because they're one of the first berry crops that we have early in the spring, when the populations haven't built up yet. But in a tunnel situation, those spotted wing drosophila are protected in the tunnel because it's a nice warm environment. So they can tend to be a bigger problem in a high tunnel situation. So if you do want to think about growing strawberries, just keep in mind you'll also have to have a control plan for spotted wing drosophila. I'll show you a little bit of the data from our strawberry work that we did. So this is, we transplanted our strawberries back in at the end of September. Generally in the open field, we're going to transplant them early September. And we compared two systems in this case, the high tunnel system and the open field. And we had a replicated trial. We looked at three different day neutral berries. So Albion, San Andreas, and Seascape. And then we looked at three June bearers. So Chandler, Radiance, and Strawberry Festival. We planted all these in 14 foot by two foot plots. So we had 28 plants per plot. 
and we staggered a double row on black plastic in our tunnel, and then we spaced the plants a foot apart in the row and between our double rows. And we used a pre-plant fertilizer of soybean meal at 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And then we fertilized bi-weekly with fish emulsion to give our strawberries a pound of nitrogen per acre per day. We also brought in class C bumblebee hives. And this is important because you're not going to get uh, the pollination unless you bring in hives for something like strawberry. And again, for that high value, you really wanna make sure that you have the bees in there that are gonna pollinate your crop. It's not an issue in the field, but it can be an issue in a tunnel. So you wanna think about that. We brought in hives in November and then again in February and in April. And we manage these organically. In tomatoes in a high tunnel, you also need pollination and some people bring in bumblebee hives for their tomato crop. Some people just uh, have their trellis system and kind of shake the trellis and that's enough to help pollinate your tomato crop. So both of those will work, but tomatoes are buzz pollinated. So that's really important too. So for our winter high tunnel strawberries, we harvested once a week and we started harvesting in December. And this is the ni another nice thing about strawberries because who doesn't want fresh local strawberries um, in early December into January? If we planted slightly earlier, we probably would have had them by Thanksgiving, but we had one month of harvest in the winter and then it starts to get to the coldest part of the year. We had six harvests in that time at the beginning and at the end we snuck in two. And so, when the temperature gets really cold in that January, then we put row covers over our strawberries. We used a double layer of row cover and we just let them rest in the coldest part of our winter. Then in the spring, we take the row covers back off. We have a second harvest off those high tunnel berries. So we get two harvests from one. We started harvesting twice a week from March to June 14th over three months. And we had 21 harvests in that time. Compared to the field in the spring, we harvested twice a week and we didn't have berries till April 6th. They went till June 29th. So again, about three months and we had about 23 harvests. But you can see the jump on time that you get there. So we harvested that spring crop a month earlier than those spring open field berries were ready. So we have the advantage there when nobody else has strawberries at a market. The other nice thing about high tunnel berries, and this you can tell this is an old photo because I don't think they even make blackberries anymore, <laughs> but you get very large berries in there, especially on your first harvest. So this was our collaborator at Texas A&M, Russ Wallace, and he put one of the strawberries on its blackberry just to show you how large those strawberries get. The other great thing about high tunnel berries, because they're not getting that overhead rain, which we get a lot of in the spring during strawberry season, that can really make or break the flavor on your strawberries. In a high tunnel where you're controlling the irrigation and the water that's going on that crop, you are giving it enough where you can concentrate those sugars in the fruit. So you can see here, these blue columns are our winter berries and they were significantly sweeter than either our high tunnel berries in the spring or in the open field in the spring. Just really high sugar levels. So in something like Albion and Seascape, you can see we had about 10% sugars in those. Same for Strawberry Festival. So you not only get large fruit, but you get really, really sweet and flavorful fruit in a tunnel as well. So for us, we found for overall yield for high tunnel winter berries, Radiance and Strawberry Festival did well for us. In the spring, we found that Albion and San Andreas did better for us. So even though we got two crops off, we saw differences in the high tunnel winter and spring. And so it might be good to plant a mix of these so you have some of those June bears and um, some of the others in there as well. In the open field in the spring, we saw it was similar to the high tunnel in the winter. Radiance and Strawberry Festival did the best for us. For quality, 
it varied a little. So the yield and the quality didn't necessarily go hand in hand. We had the best quality in seascape in the high tunnel in both winter and spring, and in seascape in Albion in the open field in the spring. So strawberry might be one that you want to plant in the fall. You can get that crop off and then get a crop of tomatoes in that would help break up your tomato monocropping. Another one that we see that's popular um, is ginger production. And these again are slides from the Wiedegers. And this production would work similarly for something like turmeric as well. Um, some of the key points, so you would get the ginger very much like you see it in the grocery store, but you wanna make sure it's disease free and virus free. So you wanna make sure you're getting it from a reputable um, dealer. You wanna pre-sprout sprout the ginger before you plant it. It is a very hungry crop, so it's gonna need both fertilizer and water. You wanna make sure you're planting it when the soil has warmed up between 55 and then on the other end, 90 degrees. It needs to be hilled kind of like a potato so you, at least you want to hill it twice three times is better and you want to top dress it when you're hilling as well and you want to water it deep before it gets dry so at least twice a week and in warmer climates you might want to think about shading so depending on where you are in tennessee shading might be in order so this is showing their transplants this was in june mid-june and as they note there, that was about three weeks later than they should have gotten it in. So they should have shot for like the last week of May to get it in, but you can see the trench they have there. And then this is their sprouted ginger. You can see how much it's grown before they put it in the ground. And then they're putting it right in that tunnel. You can see they were also experimenting with some fruit trees in this tunnel at that time as well. Then this is after their first top dressing and hilling. So building that soil up around, keeping those ginger tubers covered. This was July 5th, so about three weeks after planting. And then uh, they were eager to see what it was looking like below ground. So they chose to harvest at the end of September, which they will tell you was a little early, um, but their first harvest, this is what they got with their plants. There you can see. And this shows you from six feet of row what they got on September 29th. So really beautiful baby ginger there. Then this was the ginger in October. You can see how high it's gotten in the last bit of time there. And there's their harvest. So they got four over four pounds of that ginger. And you know what ginger can go for in the store? It can go for like 16 to $20 a pound. So that's a significant amount of ginger there. And then this is their harvest from December 10th. The trickiest thing about ginger is actually getting the ginger itself. So they get their ginger, got their ginger from Hawaiian organic ginger. You need to order ginger very, very early from them and they often are sold out very early in the year. So for example, you would order it in the fall for the next year. All right, the last stuff I'm gonna talk about is some work from Carrie Rivard, who is a colleague at Kansas State University. And he's done some really nice things with crop rotations in high tunnels to kind of get people thinking in a different sort of way about uh, what they're growing. He has a little more updated information. These prices are from 2013, so still a little old, but about 10 years younger than the prices I showed you. So what he has is different vegetable crops here on the left-hand side. The production window in the tunnel so you can see when they might be in that tunnel so tomato april to october lettuce september to may so we could plant that after the tomato same for spinach cucumber april to august bell pepper april to october salad mixes september to may and beets september to may and then the sale price and then that gross revenue per square foot so again no other vegetable is coming close to the price that the tomato can garner per square foot inside a tunnel. And you can see the other vegetable prices there. 
but what he did with this is really nice and I'll walk you through that. So he also assumes 44 cents per square foot per year for fixed cost of the structure. NC State figured about 50 cents per square foot per structure. So in two years of tomato production, you can pay for that structure. So putting these rotation scenarios together, this is the one that I mentioned at the beginning that we often see. So you might rotate between lettuce or other greens and tomatoes and back and forth year after year. This is what we don't want you to do because you're going to have tomatoes like this and then you're going to get that disease in there and your tunnel is going to be out of commission and you're either going to have to move that tunnel or go out of tomato production altogether. So Rachel talked about grafting on the last webinar. If you really are insistent on planting tomatoes year after year, at least throw in some grafted tomatoes in there that'll buy you some resistance and buy you some time in that tunnel. You'll notice here, instead of going from greens to tomatoes back to greens, he also incorporated a cover crop in there. So early we have those greens, then we plant the tomatoes, then we plant a cover crop. In that grafting year, we have a cover crop, then our tomatoes, then greens. So we're putting more space and time between the greens and the regular tomato crop. This one, again, if you're insistent on doing tomatoes, is a better option than just using all tomatoes that haven't been grafted over time but you still have other options. We talked about strawberries a little bit. So again, you can do a greens crop early, then your tomatoes, then a cover, and then get those strawberries in there in the fall. Um, and then you can do a greens crop to break up those tomatoes. And so this one, he estimates that you get a $1.76 per square foot for strawberries, but he also mentions that their spacing was pretty uh, generous in their strawberries. And they probably could tighten that up. They're doing some spacing work now, which would up the price per square foot or the revenue per square foot rather. This is another option. And we have grown specialty melons in our high tunnels. And just like with our strawberries, you're concentrating those sugars in the melons because they're not getting that overhead irrigation that's gonna dilute the sugar. Uh, when you don't want it to be diluted right before harvest. So specialty melons are another one. You're only gonna get about 90 cents per square foot in revenue, but it'll differentiate you in the market because they will be really, really sweet melons. And as you can see, they really fill in that space. He was trying to do a variety trial and he said it was a nightmare because you couldn't differentiate varieties at all. They were all tangled together. Um, and so for variety trialing, he would recommend that you put in some trellising in there. Um, we did trellis ours, but he doesn't think it makes sense for trellising for a grower if you can just go in there and harvest. But for ease of harvest, we liked ours trellised and we can use cattle panels in there or some other sort of trellising system to get them up off the ground. That'll also help with the quality of the melon if you don't have a continuous cover on the floor of your high tunnel. But another way to break up that continuous tomato rotation, but just buying a little time there. You could also use other cucurbits. Again, they're not going to bring in the value that uh, the tomatoes will, but there are folks that are doing things like English cucumber. And if you are doing a cucumber in there, you can get some, uh, you know, the thin skin cucumbers that do bring a higher value than a traditional cucumber. And getting parthenocarpic cucumbers is a great idea because then you uh, don't have the pollination issue. But again, with cucumbers, generally, you're going to need some pollinators in there as well. In this case, this grower was growing these specialty cauliflowers. So colored cauliflowers, he could get $1.25 per head or per square foot. Uh, what turned out to be $1.25 per square foot in there by growing this specialty type of cauliflower. So brassicas are another good one. As we talked about at the beginning, brassicas can have that biofumigant effect and can help with some of your disease issues. So they're great to have in your rotation, but it has to be 
generally something specialty, so you're getting a higher value per square foot in there, but they're a very short season crop, so you also have lots of opportunity to work in cover crops there as well. So, this is an example of what you might do over time in a six year rotation, um, doing those grafted tomatoes, working in specialty melons, strawberries, peppers, brassicas. He also looked at sweet potato slips, which were very lucrative for him, um, but a little sweet potato slip goes a long way. So everyone wouldn't wanna start growing sweet potato slips in their high tunnels, but that was one that was really high value for him. Um, just because he's showing it as a six year rotation doesn't mean you'd have to do it that way. You could do tomatoes once every three years, or you could work in um, whatever, however many years of rotation you could work in there. The other thing is if you do have multiple tunnels on your farm, then you can incorporate these by rotating the whole tunnels. And you can think about rotating different beds as well. So it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing proposition. You can go within one tunnel and do different beds into different crops. The other neat thing that he did is thinking about revenue in the long term. So this is overlaid of that previous slide. So we have grafted tomatoes, we have greens in that first year. We have melons and greens in that second year, greens and strawberries, greens and peppers in the fourth year. Then we have brassicas and greens in year five and the sweet potato slips and greens. So what you'll notice over time, if you add the revenue of all those crops per year, while nothing compares to tomato itself, except the sweet potato slips down here, which you got over $4 per square foot on, the average annual gross revenue across all of these crops comes out to over $4 per square foot. So when you're thinking about getting two in year three, for example, getting two crops of greens in there, getting a little over a dollar in the spring for them and almost $2 in the fall winter, and then $1.76 in the middle for your strawberries, it averages out over time. So we need to think about that whole system but we also need to think about the benefits we're getting in for our soil too, to sustain production over a longer period of time instead of really pushing our soil early with just a tomato greens rotation. So these are the resources that I mentioned. Rachel has some great high tunnel planting date calendars for three different regions of Kentucky. Those also work well for us in Tennessee. Um, the CCD also has a publication on movable high tunnels, so more information on those. If you're just considering getting a high tunnel now and you want to look into those, it's a great idea. Then those three cover crop publications that I mentioned. And lastly, we have a publication on high tunnel strawberry production here in Tennessee. So with that, oh, one more thing, two more things. So here in Knoxville, we have our UT Organic Farming and Gardening Field Day on April 28th. And that URL there will give you more information about the field day. We'd love to have you come out and see what we're doing at the organic farm. Um, and it also gives you the registration information. The other thing I wanted to show you was this is after that SARE tomato trial that I showed you where we had a lot of yellow shoulder, we really wanted to work on our nutrients and we just threw everything in our tunnel. So we did a five cover crop mix. We did cowpea, we did buckwheat, we did sunflower, we did mustard, we did millet. And I put them up there because I cut some of them off to get the picture to fit in there. But the other nice thing about it was we run a CSA and we could use the sunflowers, as well as these nice stalks in our bouquets to put in our CSA. So we're getting the benefits of the cover crop, but still utilizing the top half and making bouquets out of them for our CSA. So working on our soil, but helping our CSA out at the same time. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have or open it up for discussion.